Welcome to KGW News at 5 o'clock. I'm Laurel Porter, and we begin with the coronavirus pandemic. The virus is still spreading in every part of the state, but maybe not quite as fast as before, which is good news, even as the numbers remain high. The Oregon Health Authority reported 423 new cases today. That's one of the highest daily totals we've seen. And it puts the state's total number of infections past 20,600. Nine new deaths were also reported today, bringing that total to 348. Despite that, state health leaders are encouraged by the recent trend. KGW's Pat Doris reports. The nonpartisan investigative reporting group Center for Public Integrity reports that Dr. Deborah Burks, who leads the fight against the pandemic in the country, named Portland as one of the 10 virus hotspots nationally during a recent conference call. That's news to Multnomah County's top public health doctor, who was not invited to take part in the call. I don't see any sign that things are taking off or getting ready to take off and get out of hand anytime soon. Dr. Jennifer Vine said the city and county are doing reasonably well in the battle against the virus. She mentions Portland in that list and she refers to high levels of virus. And it's really not clear um, what she means by that. Um, again, in Multnomah County, our percent positive is right around 5%, which is sort of the what the, the threshold for when you start to worry. Um, and we know that our cases, our, cum our running cases per 100,000 um, are actually quite a bit less than many of our peer counties across the country. Also today, the Oregon Health Authority reported that while test results found 6.2% of patients positive over the last week, that's up, by the way, from 5.7 the week before, the overall spread of the virus seems to have slowed. Instead of each positive person infecting on average one and a half new people, as was the case earlier, health leaders say the average positive person now only infects one other person. State epidemiologist Dr. Dean Seidliger talked about the lower rate during a conference call today. These numbers tell us that many Oregonians are taking action to stem the speed at which the virus is spreading. People are listening to Governor Brown's orders to wear face coverings, limit gathering sizes, and the hours that restaurants and bars are open. People are staying physically distant. Oregon is still a long ways from controlling the coronavirus, but the past week is encouraging. Governor Kate Brown told me earlier this week, though, during an interview that it is way too soon to relax. We are probably going to have to live with the impacts of the virus um, for weeks and months to come. And I just want to, again, reiterate that it's so important. Each one of us can make a difference by taking personal responsibility and making sure that we're protecting ourselves, protecting our family members, and protecting our neighbors and our community members. In the meantime, the governor plans to release guidance next week for face coverings that will be required when workers return to their offices. The governor also talked about the idea of restricting out-of-state visitors to slow the spread of the virus. Seems less likely now. Turns out there's a lot of people from Oregon who work in Washington, Idaho, and California. And there's a whole lot of semi-trucks that roll through Oregon as part of interstate commerce. But today, the State Parks Department did say it would start to levy a 30% surcharge on out-of-state visitors who want to use our campgrounds. So there's that. In Northeast Portland, Pat Doris, KGW News. And we'll talk about that camping fee later. The Washington Department of Health says there are now 11 children who've contracted a rare illness linked to COVID-19. And here is the breakdown. There's a couple in Franklin County, three in King County, one in Skagit, two in Snohomish, and three in Yakima County. They've all been diagnosed with multi-system inflammatory syndrome. That's a rare but serious condition. The state is asking health care providers to be on the lookout for possible cases. The July jobs report released today points to a slowing in the nation's economic recovery. According to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, nearly 1.8 million jobs were added last month. That's down significantly from the almost 5 million added in June. However, the July numbers are better than economists expected. The unemployment rate did fall from just over 11 percent to 10.2 percent. Talks have stalled in Washington, D.C. over a new coronavirus relief plan. And that means another week without boosted unemployment checks for the millions of Americans still out of work. Congress and the White House haven't been able to agree on just how much money should be spent on the relief bill. Unfortunately, they rejected it. 
They said they couldn't go much above their existing one trillion, and that was disappointing. Uh, the chief and I will recommend to the president, based upon uh, our lack of activity today, to move forward with some executive orders. President Trump has threatened if a deal is not reached soon, he'll issue executive orders to restore federal unemployment checks, halt evictions, suspend student loan payments, and defer payroll taxes. But there are questions over whether he could legally go around Congress. We turn now to Portland's protests going on for more than 70 nights. The mayor says some of the actions he's seen are criminal. In one case, the equivalent, he says, of attempted murder. Overnight, we saw more chaos. So our question is, what do other city leaders and those vying for the job of mayor have to say? Here's Maggie Vespa. To those outside East Precinct, this gathering has been declared a lawful assembly. Protests and also violence in Portland played out once again overnight at the Portland Police Bureau's East Precinct. Our cameras spotted a fire in a trash can and police tweeted out this photo of a woman doused in paint. The story behind that in a minute. Police said in a news release, people in the crowd spray painted and tore down security cameras and threw large rocks and fireworks at officers. That in mind, based on what we saw and on what police said, things last night didn't escalate quite as much as they did the night before. A night that prompted the mayor and police chief to hold a news conference and basically say this. The attack was immediate, it was intentional, and it was planned. I believe that city staff could have died last night. Wednesday night, police said protesters tore down boards from the precinct's windows and used them to lock 20 police officers inside East Precinct. Then police said they used accelerant to try and set fire to the building. Police fired tear gas to break the crowd up and put the fire out. Last night, Portlanders showed up to guard that building, including a woman with a walker who was holding a Black Lives Matter sign. This video of her was shot by Zane Sparling with Pamplin Media Group. According to police and multiple reports, people in the crowd doused her with paint. Police also said they feared that fire in the trash can could have caught the building on fire. Today, KGW reached out multiple times to every sitting city commissioner, Joanne Hardesty, Chloe Udaly, and Amanda Fritz. None of them joined the mayor, police chief, or Portland Fire in denouncing the violence yesterday, and none of them has gotten back to us today. One person who has spoken out, the mayor's opponent in the November election, Sarah Ayanna Roan. She appeared on this week's edition of Straight Talk with Laurel Porter, an interview taped Thursday afternoon. She's attended many protests for Black Lives matter and against police violence, and she's an avid critic of the police. I understand why they're angry. But lighting fires with people inside the building, would you denounce that part of it with lighting fires, arson with people inside buildings? I'm not the person setting the fires. I'm not the person doing the graffiti. But will you denounce I'm it? I'm not here to tell them how to protest. So you won't I denounce it? smash windows. I clean, I clean up when things are unfairly targeted, but here's what I have to say. Their outrage at the police is valid. Today, Ayanna Roan's campaign sent us a statement. It reads, in part, criminal activity is illegal, and of course I don't condone it. What I'm focused on is ensuring police do not use violence and even lethal force against people who have done nothing wrong. It went on to say, I condemn arson. Obviously, I also condemn the countless deaths of black individuals at the hands of police. Maggie Vespa, KGW News. We've been following the protests in Portland since the beginning. To see all of our coverage, head to the KGW YouTube page. We've created a special playlist there. We're waiting to hear more about what happened during a youth group trip along the Columbia River when a youth pastor and young boy drowned. It happened Wednesday afternoon at Marina Beach. As Joe Ranieri reports, the pastor died trying to save the lives of others who were struggling in the water. 44-year-old Andy Inskeep had only been a youth pastor for a year with the Ridgefield Church of the Nazarene. I remember several people in the interview process saying, Andy will make every person around him feel known, loved, and valued. And, and you know, for sure, that's, that's exactly what he did. In that short time, he made a big difference with kids at the church. Uh, Andy was the guy who always went to look for the one who was lost. He would go find the kid who was overlooked. Um, he would find the kid who's kind of left out of the crowd. Um, 
He would find those kids, get to know them, love them. Andy was with a group of nearly 20 who went swimming Wednesday at Marina Beach along the Columbia River and Hood River. Many in the water that day were kids from his youth group. The area the group was swimming in can be extremely dangerous, according to Sergeant Pete Hughes with the Hood River County Sheriff's Office. Hughes says the sandbar can go from a three foot drop off to a 30 foot drop off almost immediately. More than two of them got into some trouble, uh, got out to that drop off and got into the deeper water and struggled. Nearby swimmers got to shore safely or were rescued by a nearby boat or windsurfers. An 11 year old boy who was with a group from a different church also drowned. Andy did all he could to help those kids. It does look like Andy went into the water to rescue some of the students who were struggling and, um, and then lost his life in the process of rescuing others. A man who was described as doing all he could for others. We're gonna miss him. He was, he was becoming a friend to me and to other staff members. Joe Ranieri, KGW News.